Inviting me back it has a word in it. I uh, really am honored. This is an incredibly uh, harrowing drive this time of year from Tennessee to Kentucky to here because of the tornado season. And uh, 57 years old, uh, 33 years of high school teaching. Uh, the, you know, I'm in bed at 8:30 every night to get up at five so I can inspire uh, 136 uh, teenagers in advanced placement language and composition every day. So I'm I'm pretty well wore out. And, uh, but, and I keep telling Bill that, well, this is my last time. And I tell my friends, Aaron and, and, and Jinglebach, who dutifully ride with me all night long, that this is my last time. This is my farewell tour. And, um, but it's such a wonderful conference that it's just, it's, it's, it is hard to resist. Because everybody who comes uh, is passionately interested uh, in what we can learn here, and what we can share, and what we can visit with. And, First time I came, Greg and I were talking, I think it was 1996, I think it was the second year of the, of, of the Long Hunter. It was back before, you know, uh, laptops were much around or, or PowerPoints. And, and I remember, uh, maybe somebody might have been here, but I handed out photocopies of kind of like lecture notes with blanks. And as I was going through and talking, you could fill in the blanks. And, and, uh, and I just went, I went through the entire colonial uh, hunting trade culture and how people made money and how they lived and died and their sense of humor. And, it was wonderful and talks came. Was that was that a barn or something? Or was that it was somewhere around here? Right here. Right here. Right here? Yeah. It was in this room? It doesn't seem like the same room. Burned out. Okay, there you go. That's why it's not the same room. And uh, then, um, well, I, I'm done. Does anybody, anybody have any questions about this? <laughs> <laughs> well for it. You have to give me three months notice. So I can make up the t-shirts, you know? Yeah. We have to have t-shirts for the We have the t-shirt sales, yes. Okay. Well, why do we love what we do or how Bruce Willis became a long hunter? Boy, that's a challenging question. But I'm going to prove to you that it's true. Because you know it's like you don't believe me. I'm doubtful. All right. So <laughs> As I say to my students, be a critical thinker. Just because I speak does not mean it's truth with a small T. But when I speak, it's always truth with a capital T. But I've got to prove it to you. I've got to prove it to you. Let's take a, uh, a look um, at some ideas my perspective. You've come far, Pilgrim. Remember what that movie that's from? Everybody knows that one. What was it? Jeremiah Johnson. Well, those are my shoe pads. And I, I, I hear that in my head every now and then. You've come far, Pilgrim. But then my conscience tells me, and I still have a far way to go before I rest. Uh, my approach is, and my articles are in Love and Order, uh, Pilgrim's Journey, I am not... Uh, Moses with the long hunter commandments, although I could write them, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm, uh, I know that. And uh, I am a pilgrim, and I'm learning, and I've done wore out plenty of shoes trying to figure this out, but as one of my old friends, Mark Fairchild, said, who's a hunter extraordinaire, <coughs> I was talking to him about the first deer I'd lost flip-flop hunting, and I couldn't find it, and he's Mark, after a few moments of talk, Mark, we will never be as good as they were. Thank you, Mark Fairchild. Just straighten me out. You know, because you know, the, the illusion of the quest in our modern world of, of trying to rediscover and redefine and re-experience and, and re-become uh, is an impossibility. If I could, if I could uh, transmorgify in Woodbridgeville, if I could transmorgify all my collection of friends into one being, and pick out the best skills of the ones I know. Trapping here, hunting there, packing lightly here, woodscraft there, uh, wisdom here, uh, funny stories there, snore free there, and put them all into one personality, we would still be short. If I could took the best of all my friends. Because we're not living it every day. It's impossible to do. But the, the, the journey is incredible, fascinating. And when you take something um, and make it yours, you get just another little bit. So what do you do with a pilgrim like me? Well, I, hopefully today you'll be patient. And you'll understand that I don't uh, propose to know everything, but I do know some things.
but I'm always a student. There's always things. I've, I've learned things already the first 24 hours I've been here. <laughs> One of which is, don't rip the water. Baby. Okay. <laughs> and so what we largely do is we study, because in this 18th century frontier, and we don't have, about half the people could sign their name, so less than that could actually write to some sort of complex level, we don't have a lot of written evidence of first person people and very few comparative illustrations. So figuratively what we're doing is we are traveling all the time beyond maps. We are, we are trying to rediscover, re-understand um, what it must have been like, you know, and the, old, the idea is that we want to, hopefully if there's some sort of magical thing, we, like the old Buckskin Report days of the 70s, if we could be transported back to some foggy meadow on the mountain head man and come out of the fog, if we could all of a sudden find ourselves and, you know, on the outside walls of Fort Pitt, at least they wouldn't put us in jail for being a witch. Uh, or some oddity or some lunatic, we'd actually like, blend in, at least until we opened our mouth. And then our dialect and our language would give us away. But, you know, that kind of what we'd be hoped for, and, and that's the best we do. But we're really, we're really venturing into the unknown. Now, let's just review this a little bit. We are here because we are enchanted by the frontier. We are enchanted by the frontier because of these iconic heroes that perhaps we didn't realize where they came from. They're rooted in Puritan ideals of self-reliance and how you get there, industrious, simplicity, temperance, self-reliance. They are rooted in the idea of a free Englishman being an armed Englishman, a citizen, a citizen of the frontier with those qualities, who has somehow, because of the natural man influences of her soul, escaped the American dream element of property, power, prestige, and can live simply with everything on his back. All right. That's part one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next. Looks like I got I apologize. <laughs> you know, wonderful first person impressionation in the cabin, you know, at the, you know, at the noon hour. And, and, that, and that's, that's, a, that's a result of living history ideas, of trying to take this persona that we see in fragments of documents and put it together and create a persona that helps, it, helps bring history to life. Williamsburg was the first one to start that. They started that in the 30s. And then they had the debate, okay, what do we do when somebody's going to the bathroom when there's an emergency? Uh, uh, how, do, how do we do it? What happens when they ask us something that's sensitive like uh, slavery or, or racial tension? What do we do with this? Or, or how's this bill recruit? You know, so they had these rules about when you're in character and when you're out of character and, and, how, and how it goes. Like, so it, it's, so there's this, this debate rise between static history and living history and what is more valuable and what is not and what is juvenile and what is mature. We're, we're juveniles, by the way, according to academy, uh, ac academia. But, so you have this triad, in effect. If you're a living historian who wants to be an experimental archaeologist and relearn these skills, you have three parts. You, got, you have the document, the static history. You have the artifacts, the tools and the equipment. And then you have the process of trying to reuse them based on a document like this. And you, then you try to relearn a skill that's been lost based on the list, based on maybe a journal or a diary. And then you begin to rediscover and you experiment. What are they using it for? And, and, and what, what is interesting connection is it's at the bottom and they, the most clerks I found will list everything in like categories. This is a hunch of stopping here. Okay, what do I need in shooting supplies? And then what do I, what kind of clothing do I need? It'll be in groups, but this, this half, one and a half yard of linen is off by itself. Imagine, sure. And so based on 45 pounds of lead and various calibers, James spent his time on his lunch hour figuring out, okay, if you had different calibers, how many balls would that need, how many patches would that convert to? He, he just went crazy. He took this big long letter. And that, that's what the experiments archaeology is doing. You're trying to take those slices and make meaning out of them. Yes? Which word's a really cool one? I'm going to get to that. Thank you. That's a great word, isn't it? That's a jingle box word. And that, welcome to my school. What does it mean, jingle box? That means I'm going to be constipated, huh? Thank you. <laughs> now that's what Jingle Box thinks. Okay, this is what it really means. And so you have uh, the, the stretching needles for the hides, you know, for the, the, you know, 
on the loops, you know, knit needles, skeins of thread, they need to sew and patch, and uh, kettles, corns, beaver traps, luxivated corn. Luxivated is a coin verb. It's a noun to mean into a verb, and luxivate means the process of breaking something off of the joint. So what would luxivated corn be? Shell corn. Shell, corn. yeah, whole corn dry. And then and notice the difference, Indian meal. And so Morgan basically sells three types of corn, luxivated, Indian meal, and corn flour. Of course, Indian meal is your grit kind of consistency. And you always were charged for the container. Now we just get, you know, those plastic bags that are annoying at the grocery store, you know. And but back in the day, they would charge you for the bag. You try to fill in the gaps by doing and see what you can learn. All right? And so that idea of, so what William Sutherland was saying is that I'm packing light. I'm packing very, very light, and I'm trying my best to get home and get home safely and outrun these Indians and not be seen. Now, so packing lightly is always the quest. How much can I get by with and do and, and be comfortable and safe and responsible? And there's always that paradox. I want to do it historically correct, but I know I have a family and bills. I, I've been domesticated. I've done, saved, corn, Alice, and what has it done to me? i got to get working. But this is the basic stuff that I like to carry in my bed. And I've got it organized. There's a pan on this side and cornmeal on this side. So that, that um, Indian meal over here. And so, and I'll just lay this out as I go along. And whatever the bag is, this is what I just transfer to, but the bags get bigger depending on the season and what I might need to be carrying as clothing, for example. Um, sharpening, you know, sticking, and, uh, stone, etc., right? You know, laid out. And then, um, Muscovado and chocolate. Now, if you want to duplicate this, go to your Hispanic uh, food section. Find the Muscovado sugar. It'll be brown and ugly. It looks like it's uh, a rock. It is. Break it up carefully. Get Baker's unsweetened chocolate. About two pounds of sugar, one pound of chocolate. You've got a pretty good colonial facsimile. So that's my coffee ration. And it's interesting, in, in Hollingshead accounts, it was chocolate first, coffee first, and then every once in a while, a hyson tea or black tea. But that was way down the line as far as popularity. Dr. Pepper was a strong fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Little folding knife. Uh, fishing kit. Now, the fishing kit, I seldom get to fish, but the fishing kit is really my first aid kit or repair kit. You can, you can imagination go, right? Jim Briggs, uh, a fine woodsman, one of, was my first trekking partner way back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. One guy wanted to go out with him, so he took him out, and they, they got drinking a little bit too much uh, of the rum, and the guy was trying to throw Jim's uh, belt axe, and he, he cut his thigh open. So they were back in the woods, and he's bleeding like crazy. So what should I do? What, what would you do, Jim? You're a woodsman. What would you I'd sew it up. All right, sew it up. And of course, he's drunk. So Jim, Jim takes out his sewing kit and his fishing kit, and he sews it up. They get him into the emergency room. They have to get him out of the woods, down the road, in the hospital. The doctor looks at those. This is Monday morning, so it took him all weekend to get him out. I could have done a better job than that. We'll just leave it like it is. And then put some antiseptic on it and it was good. So it really does work. Um, Castile soap. Again, you can buy Castile soap a lot of ways, but if you want the true 18th century fashion, find, make sure that the root ingredient is olive oil. And what's nice about Castile soap, it was the so soap for sailors. And because it would make suds and salt water fresh, hot or cold, and so you could bathe. And um, it's also biodegradable, so it, you know, if you're thinking in the modern green, you know, that it's not putting that, uh, there, yeah, there you go. You don't want the, it, you don't want to be breaking down the old towel, it's in the barrel. So just hold it, and it's wet, and just, you just run it down like this, you know, about the width of your barrel, it's on the end, you dip it in the water, down it goes. Yeah, and tie, you know, take your lock off and tie your, your bandana, you know, your scarf around it or something. And water from out that end. Pull it out, got to undo it, it'll be all, it'll be all twisted like it is now. You've got to get it off. It's wet and dirty. Take that first one and wipe all your brass down with it. It'll be black. It's, you know, if you have cuts in your finger, it'll sting. Put another one on there, another wet one, and three, four, five times. It's dry. 
10 now, or so. Now, if you do, you know, what rainy weather? Do you think it tallow. Yes, probably the same rifling outside dimensions, weight, length as the Shrite rifle because he was involved in the restoration of it. So he was able to examine it. So the Getz Barrel Company then made my barrel. Uh, is that, so. I think so. They, they, well, they are existing. We don't know when it started. Okay. James Moore would go lighter than me, and, I would, and we'd have debates about what is safe and unsafe. And uh, he would go even smaller, 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 so you can go. And uh, other people go more and more and more. And I had an old friend that went home because he broke his ramrod. He, he got, to, got to this van, we parked the cars, we loaded up our guns, he broke the ramrod, he got in his truck and went back home. I don't think Thomas Sharp Spencer would be inviting this guy to go on a hunt. You know, there's an opportunity now to do some living history, to do some experiment, to make something your own. Okay, I put my ramrod, what am I gonna do? All right, J Jingle Block, help me find a, a hickory tree. You know, how many identify it? Let's, let's find a good one. Let's, let's make a ramrod, you know, let's get through this. And then I, I've got an experiment. I'm not good enough at it because I have to learn. But then it would become experiential and I would, I would learn something. Well, that's the same way you want to do when you, um, when you put your gear together and you begin practicing with it, that, that you're going to be a student forever, but you're going to gradually get into the advanced classes.